Hey everyone, this is Andrew, and in this video I wanted to give you an introduction to Contact 6, or for the most part, also an introduction to Contact in general. Complete 12 came out a couple weeks ago, and with that we saw the introduction of Contact 6, so I'm going to use that for this video, but just so you know, pretty much everything in this video can be applied to both. The only difference is going to be in terms of a couple new features, which I'm not going to talk about in this video, um, and then there's also the kind of the way that the various effects are laid out. Aside from that, everything is the same. So anyways, let's dive right into it. This is the contact six interface. If you're in logic, the way that you get to that is you click this down arrow and it's gonna expose a list and you go to native instruments and click contact. I loaded it in stereo. Now you have contact open and if you have contact player, then this video does not really apply to you because you can't create new instruments in Contact Player. You can only load instruments that you have either purchased um, that have the full player licensing or, um, well, or the ones that came with the library. So only player instruments, which are typically more expensive than full library instruments because you have to license them through native instruments. So we're going to talk about how to make instruments. First of all, you double click in this blank area and you can create a new instrument. You can click the wrench icon, which is called edit mode. And that brings you to this kind of overwhelming interface um, that, don't worry, you'll get used to it, but it's, it's the interface. Now, these knobs up top, you have something instrument options. Don't worry about that just yet, but it lets you sign something like your background wallpaper and resource containers. Don't worry about it. And other various parameters of how contact in the background is handling certain features. You have the, probably the most important thing to take note of in this top list is the mapping editor and the group editor. Now the mapping editor is where you map out your samples. Since Contact is a sample playback engine, you're going to put your samples along the keyboard for different velocity layers. So velocity layer is when you click a note softly, it might trigger it down here. When you hit it as hard as you can, it's going to trigger up here. So you can have different samples, not only for every key but for every velocity layer. Now you can also break down those samples into different groups. So you can have, let's say, a guitar on group one, a keyboard on group two, and drums on group three. And then depending on how you set up your instrument, you can give yourself ways to control which group is playing for which parameter you want to set. So I can close those like that. If you go to the wave editor, well actually you probably need the mapping editor for that, You'll be able to click on a sample and control the actual sound um, in different ways. We'll get into that in a sec. Then you have the script editor. Now this can get pretty advanced or it can be very simple. You can go into presets, go to factory, and you can look at various different things you can do. For example, you can throw in an arpeggiator. You can throw in a performance tool that allows you to turn your instrument into a monophonic portamento based instrument and a whole other, a whole bunch of other stuff so but if you want to get more advanced you can write your custom ksp script in here or copy and paste it in here if you're using like ksp editor <clears throat> I'm not going to cover a ksp in this video because uh, that's that's a big 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 topic um, but if you want to start in that i would look up the ksp reference manual i don't know if there's been a new one for contact 6 released yet um, but the contact 5 one will at least cover 95 percent of everything that's going to be included um, in, in what you need to know for KSP. So anyways, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go into the mapping editor and I'm going to get some samples that I have and I'm just going to grab them. Let's see this one's 70 something samples. I'm going to drag them in and I think I started these with a C. I'm not hundred percent sure. So I'm going to line them up there. The way this works is as you go up, it'll kind of widen your samples. If you drag it down just above, it'll do one note per key. And it might take a second to load. I have a relatively good computer, so it's pretty fast. And then on your keyboard. And you already have an instrument. Let me just adjust my microphone here. And I'm gonna change the uh, octave actually, because right now it's it's not really mapped correctly. Um, this is probably more like C zero. Oh, these are gonna these are messed up. Don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> it's just because I dragged them in too high of a note. So 
these are samples that I captured um, one note per key on a physically modeled uh, piano. And the first way you can control this after you map your samples, now again, you don't have to do one note per key. I can literally delete half of this, grab this sample and stretch it. And that, that affects the, you know, realisticness of the sound because you're, you're stretching a sample across those higher notes. Now, the first thing you want to consider is your source. This is going to be kind of how it plays back. It's either going to treat the samples as a sampler, DFD, I don't actually know what it stands for, but the difference with sampler is that it actually kind of loads the samples into memory um, versus DFD where it's just referencing them off the computer. So they have different performance things, but in general, just choose sampler. Um, it has to load the sample so that it can process them. But you'll, you'll avoid some file issues, and you can also do things like shift the start time of the sample. So in general, I use sampler. Don't worry about the other parameters for now. Now, first, I'll just kind of work downwards. Um, you have group insert effects. You can add things like filters, dynamics, uh, stomp effects, etc. Um, you have your amplifier. Now, if you were to click mod on your amplifier, you're going to see that there's an envelope or ADSR. There's also velocity. Now, you can control the intensity of when the velocity by changing the slider. So if I make it all the way up, there's a lot of velocity control depending on how hard I hit it. So I usually do something like halfway. Otherwise, it just it kind of makes playing a little awkward. Um, and I believe you can also do things like you know, you can go into this preset thing and you can make it like a linear response or, whoops, you can also go in, make it a random response. So uh, there's different different ways to, uh, oh, there we go, to, to control how the velocity is handled. But this envelope, anytime you add an envelope or some other kind of mod source, it's going to bring it down to the bottom of the screen. So this is the volume ADSR, or ADHSR, or AH, yeah, AHDSR. And this is, you know, you have various parameters like attack. So if I make this really high, bring that back down. If I make this very high, now when I play those high notes that correspond to this very stretched out sample, it's making them sound weird because to play a sample back at different speeds, unless you're doing some kind of fancy algorithm, um, you're basically just playing the sample faster. So if I hit this, then I hit all the way up here. Oh, whoops. You notice that the high sample dies down much faster. And this is because it's playing the sample back faster. So that's kind of just how it works, which is one reason why it doesn't always work. Now, it's very common to get a sample and stretch it across two, three, four, five notes. You wouldn't necessarily want to do like five octaves. Um, if you play it back at, you know, these two notes, what note is that? It's got a G bass. So stretch across G, G sharp, A. Let's go all the way up to C. In general, no one's going to notice the fact that that's not a new sample. You can also counter this by sampling your instrument um, with multiple round robins. Now, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but basically that means that if I hit the same note twice, it's going to play a different sample and alternate in a list of various allowed samples. But that's how this, this, this mapping thing works. So you, know, you have your ADSR, you have your mapping, and just that alone, you can basically just record an instrument load up your samples, and you have a pretty controllable sound. Now, the next thing that you, you're going to want to do, probably, is you're going to want to add some kind of effects. Um, if you're sampling a synthesizer, one common way to do that is to sample the synthesizer with the filter all the way open, or at its highest position, so that the most amount of uh, frequencies are coming through. And what that allows you to do is put on a filter. I usually do the latter uh, uh, four pole filter or four stage, I, I forget, um, <laughs> filter. 
um, which is kind of like a Moog ladder filter, I believe. And that allows you to filter the sound source inside of contact instead of on your synthesizer. And this gives you a lot more control because now in here, if I sampled it like that, I wouldn't be able to create this. Oh, sorry, I think I overloaded. If you want to turn down the volume, you just uh, go to the slider. So, it, you know, recording the samples with the most amount of frequencies will allow you to filter them later. Now, if you're using an instrument that is very dependent on the sound of the filter, this doesn't apply, then you'll have to get into more creative techniques of sampling where you record the filtered sounds and different steps. And then when someone turns a cutoff knob, it's gonna switch between those different blended filter sounds, but not going into that, just wanted to let you know. Now, once you have this kind of filtered sound, which is very nice, uh, you can go to your instrument send effects. You can also do it in, in here, but I usually do them here. I can put on replica delay, which is the new contact six delay, or the legacy delay, which in contact five will just be called delay. Now, if you wanna change the time to instead be a millisecond range to a beat dependent range, you just click this millisecond symbol here. And that will allow you to switch to quarter notes. You can make it two quarter notes all the way up to 12 quarter notes. Uh, if I turn up the return, that's gonna control how much volume's coming back, feedback, how many different iterations of the delayed signal are gonna come back, and then pan, how much it bounces between left and right channels. I'm gonna unfilter the sound a little bit. Let me turn down on my release. So already we've gotten kind of a piano-ish tone and turned it into almost like a, a lead or pad synthesizer. And you can go through and add reverb and you can add, uh, what's it called, chorus, flanger, all that stuff. I'm not gonna get into that because it's pretty intuitive now that you've seen how you control it and add it, just go in and play yourself. Um, again, up here in group effects, you can also add other filters and uh, things like compressors and stuff. But now, very quickly, let's talk about the wave editor. So this allows you to do something like, let's say for these high note, what I wanna do is I want to loop it. So I'll turn on the loop and I can grab it here or I can grab it here and move that around. Um, I can grab the end. Sometimes it's tricky to grab it with the mouse. So I usually just kind of do this. Um, and I can do like this and then I can make the crossfade bigger. And then when I hit that note, Now it's just gonna sustain forever. Now, the quality of that crossfade depends on the type of sample and also how you set your loop start and loop end. If you set your loop start to be here, note that you won't be able to actually get a crossfade because it crossfades the beginning of the sound. It doesn't crossfade like from the end back to the beginning. It does the beginning lead in over this part. So you have to have your loop offset from that. You can do different parameters like until release, which basically, if I let go, it's gonna keep playing the sample. Whereas if I do until end, and let go, it actually keeps looping until the sound dies off. So those are just two different ways to consider doing it. If you wanna get your loop point perfect and you don't want a big crossfade, you can go to loop edit, and this allows you to very finely adjust until you get like a very small error between the offset points. You can try to zeroize the sound on both the start and loop uh, end positions. Uh, it's a little tricky, um, especially if you have a stereo sample because you're, does, the cross points aren't necessarily the same in both. In fact, they're pretty much always not. So um, mono samples are a lot easier than stereo samples in that regard. If we go back here and I make the crossfade like, uh, try to get something small. So that's very obvious. That's just because of the volume difference. Um, if you had a more consistent volume sample, it might sound better. But get, then again, that loop point might not be perfect and the crossfade might not be right. Um, depending on what you want, you can also do this until end left right symbol. That's just going to, instead playing it back um, from end to start, it's going to play it back 
uh, bouncing. So if I do this here, so you'll get a little glitches and stuff depending on your sound source and how much you finagle it in here. It's going to depend on the quality of that. Now, lastly, if you want to get what you did here and apply it to all these other samples, if you highlight these samples and make sure that the sample that you just added that loop to is actually the selected one. I do that by always doing it to the highest or lowest sample and then dragging to that. Then you can go into this little wrench or gear icon. You click to all selected zones, copy current zones loop settings. When it asks you, do you want to do this, it's going to take a while. Click OK. For me, it takes like less than a second. Um, now if I play this note, is that the right note? Oh. Down here. Where is it? Oh, there we go. See, now it is applied to that. If I go to this uh, C sample here, it's also applied there. So it's just grabbing whatever loop parameters you set to one of them and copying it to the rest, which, in a lot of cases, if you do your sampling the right way, will be very good. If you want to go in and make it more humanized, you can go in and start tweaking the uh, loop range and loop points of each sample so that way things don't loop around at the exact same instant if you hold a chord. Uh, this, this has advantages because sometimes the sample there is a noticeable dip in volume which may not be very much of a problem in, with like a single note but if you have like eight notes you're playing at the same time um, then uh, it's going to be a very noticeable dip in volume. So sometimes depending on the instrument it's nice to do that <clears throat> and i think that's all we'll talk about for this video but just to kind of summarize uh you know in this video you learned how to open up contact kind of what the different segments do in the window how to i don't know what this random oh there we go um what the different segments do how to load in samples stretch them across the keyboard how to adjust loop positions of the samples in the wave editor how to add a group insert effects to control the cutoff. How to add send effects like delay and reverb. Also how to edit the ADSR and even go in and um, edit the other modulations for the amplifier. And also it applies the same for other modulations. So anyways, I think that's it for this video. In future videos we'll get into more advanced topics like having different groups of samples, uh, adding different types of effects, adding different types of modulations and other things I think about on the fly. So if you enjoyed this video, it helped you out, please leave a like, subscribe for more. I upload videos every single Friday or Saturday. And yeah, see you in the next video. Bye.